so I grew up in rural Illinois, but have always loved hiking and camping. In college, I did a two-week geology field course that went through the Badlands, Black Hills, and Bighorns. Anyway, I just graduated and was missing the mountains, and as a graduation present to myself, I decided to knock off one of the biggest items on my bucket list, a West Coast road trip. When I was a kid, we learned about people who used to do coast-to-coast -coast road trips in these old cars, and ever since, I wanted to do one too. Not wanting to include my folks because they're older and not up to the kind of hiking I am, I decide to make it a solo trip. I'm a fairly big guy, not tall but broad, think Ernest Hemingway build, so about a week after graduation, I pack up my car and hit the I-80 all the way to Humboldt County, California, where I plan to camp the Redwoods for a week. Just me, my camera, and five straight days of hiking. Well, on the third day, I ended up misreading the map and zigged when I should have zagged and ended up much deeper in the Prairie Creek Redwoods than I intended. Most of the walk was pleasant, not too rough terrain, beautiful scenery, even accidentally bumped into a bachelor herd of Roosevelt elk. I kept my distance, but ran into them again when I got back to the parking lot and got tons of great pictures of the herd grazing. I am deep into the woods when I notice the trail looks a little disguised and it's starting to get dark. I only have my day pack with me, which only carries a handful of essentials, two water bottles, a first aid kit, some tape, a compass, a park map, and my buck 120 knife. Most of the park trails are surrounded by gigantic trees, fern beds, wild fennel, and the occasional rhododendron tree, but this spot had some dense scrub I couldn't see through. I stopped, pulled my knife from my bag, and strapped it to my belt, so as I'm walking on, I start getting this feeling of dread. Nobody's around, it's getting late, I can't hear any birds, and the only sound is the wind wafting through the trees. I pull my knife, but suddenly this moderately sized knife feels really small in my hands. I'm keeping my eyes and ears peeled, when all of a sudden, my instinct says, run. So I take off down the trail, getting whacked by the scrub brush around me, but finally I end up back in normal looking redwood scenery and I feel much more comfortable because I can see my surroundings. I sheathed my knife but I didn't put it back in my bag until I got back to my car. The rest of the trip I never got spooked like I did then and there. I'm not sure if I sensed a predator or if the quiet and solitude got to me or what. I know both cougars and bears frequented the area but I never saw anything. This happened years ago when I was barely 14. My middle school and middle school of my best friend at the time organized a trip abroad to Great Britain, London to be exact. It was supposed to be a few days looking at London attractions, museums, and shops. It was fun. Until it wasn't. For the day before we were supposed to leave and go home, we were taken to the streets with some interesting shops, and we received free time for shopping. And then our teachers and guide had a brilliant idea. They told us after the time for shopping ends, we have to meet at a different street than this. In retrospect, it was like a hundred meters away, but they still shouldn't have done that. Most of us have never been in London. We barely speak English. We don't have a map of the city, and roaming services don't work correctly. 90% of students got lost. I got lost with my best friend because we went in the complete opposite direction. We were both confused about the directions we were given. We were walking along the pavement. My friend was running ahead or staying behind to nervously look around. We didn't look like we were together because we were not interacting with each other. I guess that's why this happened. My friend ran ahead and stopped to look around and I saw a black car approach me and match my speed. 
I started to feel like it was a scene from a movie. It was broad daylight, there were lots of people around and no one reacted. I was confused and didn't know what was happening. Then, from the car, stepped out a man and he said, You are nice, come with me. And then he tried to grab me. The car was still running, so I suppose someone was still in it. I was stunned. I couldn't believe this was happening. At that moment, my friend ran to me from behind, grabbed me and dragged me away. We ran away from the man and the car. After some time, we stopped, and my friend nervously cried, shaking me and screaming why I didn't move when the man tried to catch me. I explained that I had a deer in headlights moment. We cooled down and managed to ask someone for help and we were found by our teachers. We never told anyone there what happened. We were sure no one would believe us. After that, when we got back, I told my parents, and I never went on a trip organized by my school. My mom considered all of it really unprofessional and irresponsible. Buckle up, sunshine. I don't do nights anymore, but for years I did nights in residential care facilities. One of the spookiest was in a soul charged dementia facility. Fifteen D3 residents, and no one but me to keep an eye on all of them. Around 3 a.m. in the morning, after doing an intentional round, which is where you check all the residents are safe and well, I hear the doorbell ring. I get a sudden wave of goosebumps because this is a secure facility and it's the middle of the night. I go and look out the window. There's no one there. I blow it off as being a hallucination. Ten minutes later, it rings again. I'm shitting myself. I go back to the window and check again. No one's there, but I look across the street and a strange car is parked there. I take a photo of it just in case and then I go back to my station where I've been playing a game of, match the card suits, with a delightful but very demented lady. I sit down and she looks at me and says, What did that gentleman want, dearie? You look like he had a bad night and needs a cuppa. Chills go down my spine, but I brush it off because hallucinations are common with dementia, and this lady is particularly prone to not being orientated to time and place. The doorbell rings again less than five minutes later, and this time I'm freaking out. Another of my residents is up and walking the hallway, painting with a clean paintbrush to keep him occupied. I pass him on the way to the front window, and he turns to me and says, Don't answer the door alone. He might hurt you. Before carrying on painting, I'm shitting myself. I'm trying not to cry. I don't know what to do. I'm a single 23-year-old female in charge of 15 people with varying stages of dementia, and the doorbell keeps ringing in the middle of the night, and it's a weekend, so my on-call won't answer the phone. She never does on the weekends. I'm looking out the window and see the same car as before, and as I'm looking around, I see a shadow move in front of the door, and a person walks around the corner, and then looks straight in the window next to me. We make eye contact, and I scream. My residents start freaking out. I'm freaking out, and the guy just bolts. I call the police. They turn up. It's chaos because I have 15 residents who've all been woken by the commotion, and now have two police officers in their space. My on-call isn't answering her phone, and I'm struggling to deal with the whole situation. Eventually, after many cups of tea and Milo, and two lots of PRN meds for the most challenging residents were mostly settled. It's now 7 a.m., and the handover shift arrives of a nurse and a caregiver. I tell them what happened, and they tell me there was a woman down the road whose house was broken into, and she was attacked in her bed by a drug seeker who ransacked her house looking for drugs. I have an internal meltdown because we have drugs in the cupboard in the med room. Good drugs, too. Morphine, methadone, fentanyl, all that stuff. I can't help but wonder if he was intentionally looking for us 
and just took the next best option. For reference, the facility was an old converted boarding house in a gentrified area, so lots of old doctors' houses in the area. Easy to make the home I worked at for a regular house. I left that job not long after because they refused to hire a second person to work the nights, despite it being understaffed according to best practice guidelines. When I was in Afghanistan, we were in the mountains right on the Pakistani border. The first few months of deployment were pretty hairy, but as soon as winter rolled around, the fighting season dried up. Things got really quiet. Night shift went from, when are we going to get hit, to, what kind of weird shit am I going to witness tonight? I think it was February or so, and I was out on guard patrol in the north-facing machine gun shack. We all had night vision devices, so since it was pitch black, we always wore them on night shifts. Well, I was looking out into the mountains when I see what looks like a guy come crawling out from behind a boulder up the hill, about a hundred meters away. Being February, we hadn't gotten hit in almost a month, because there was two feet of snow on the ground, and the temperatures were hovering right around zero, so the Taliban chucked deuces back to Pakistan and left us alone for the cold months. Now, this guy was on all fours like an animal, just sitting there, half behind a boulder, seemingly staring into my soul. So I pointed the machine gun at him and turned on the visible laser. I put the laser right on his nose and didn't get a reaction. Nothing. The guy just stared at me. So at this point, I'm getting a bit freaked out. I'd been blown up, shot at, almost RPG'd, and now some local is playing fuck-fuck games. I radioed into our tactical operations center that there was an unarmed local staring at me on the north post, and I either wanted someone to clear me to wax him or come out and look at what I was seeing. E5 on the radio tells me he's sending a private out to babysit me. Fucking dick. The guy comes out, looks up at the hill at this guy, and promptly nopes out of there. He goes back to the tactical operations center and tells the E5 that there really was a guy just staring at us out on the mountain. So the E5 comes up to the shack, and I point this guy out. I shit you not, as soon as the E5 gets an eye on the local, the guy jumps up, hops up on the boulder, and starts screaming like somebody just dipped him in boiling water. Guard tower at the east corner can now also see the guy, and as soon as the crazy local started howling, East Shack loses about a 30 round burst of 762 out over his head. That shit is loud when it's dead quiet. The crazy guy jumps off the rock and runs down the mountain, screaming the whole way. It was dead quiet the rest of the night, but the commander upped security to 50% meaning half the guys on our outpost had to pull security for the rest of the night. The running joke for the rest of the winter was to be on the lookout for the mind-controlled experiment that the CIA lost track of. It freaked me out. Good for a story, though. I had freshly turned 18 and was working a closing shift at a small cafe in a grocery store. One of my regular customers comes in. Tom. Tom liked a hug. He'd come in and call out, where's my girls? And we'd all have to awkwardly hug this 80-year-old man while he whispered, God bless you, in your ear. I hated Tom. He always held on a little too long and whispered a little too close. On this shift... I was closing alone and Tom came in at about 4pm. It's not unusual, I dealt with the creepiness and got him his coffee and bagel. He was with his wife this time, she was sweet but tired looking. He started asking me questions as I worked, what do I have to do at night, is it hard closing alone, what time am I off, do I ever get scared walking to my car in the dark. The questions got progressively more uncomfortable and his wife just sat there silently. 
I answered as friendly as I could, despite the hair on the back of my neck standing up. I would catch him staring at me often. It was okay though, I was off work at 7 so it wasn't a big deal. Until he didn't leave. His wife went home without him, and he just stayed, staring for hours. I asked if there was anything else he needed. He said, No, I'm just waiting for you to get off of work. He wanted to walk me to my car. He said, Because young girls shouldn't be in a dark parking lot alone. I told him it wasn't necessary and continued about my work ignoring him now even as he stared. He left about 15 minutes before my shift ended, into the dark Michigan winter, and I breathed a sigh of relief. I didn't think twice when I punched out and headed to my car. I grabbed my snowbrush and began clearing my car, enjoying the quiet that's unique to a snowy night. I began to hear the crunching of footsteps behind me. I brush it off. I am in a parking lot after all. But they got closer, past any other car and directly towards mine. It was parked away from all the others in the employee parking. I look, and it's Tom, maybe 50 feet away and smiling. He tells me that I should have looked for him. He'd been sitting outside waiting for me, and I should know it's dangerous for young girls to be alone in a parking lot at night. I began shaking. I tried to open my car door, but it was frozen shut due to the earlier storm. Tom came closer, calling me a stupid girl and asking God to forgive him. I debated running back into the store. He was so old, he surely couldn't have kept up, right? I didn't want to chance it though. He could have been younger as I'm a terrible judge of age, and I'm not exactly fast myself considering my weight. So, I stand my ground. I fumble in my purse for my pepper spray thankfully attached to my keys. I tell him to stay back, I have pepper spray, and to go home to his wife. He glowers at me. I show him the teal canister. We're about 15 feet apart now. He's well within range. He calls me a bitch, spits at me, and heads back into the store. I get in my half-uncovered car and drive home, terrified. I call the store when I got home and told them what had happened. They kicked Tom out and told him not to come back. He began cursing up a storm, and his wife had to come pick him up. He ended up getting arrested for indecent images of minors a couple years later, but I don't know the details as I'd moved away at that point. I can't say I'm sad to see him go, though. This happened when I was young, approximately 8 to 10 years old. I remember it perfectly, but have confirmed the details with my mother, and the memory of it sends chills down both of our spines to this day. It was broad daylight on a Saturday, and I was in the town center with my mother. The streets were busy, and people bustled past. We paused at the shop front that sold ornaments, the ugly old-fashioned kind that old grannies like. We'd often stop to look at them and laugh at how expensive they were, wondering how that place even stayed open. I was a real chatterbox as a kid, and was talking animatedly to my mother about something or other, facing her as I did so. Like it was yesterday, I remember her smiling face, and how it suddenly dropped. Her jaw hung open, and her eyes were as big as dinner plates. She just stared at me silently for a few seconds and then grabbed my arm hard and pulled me away. Her fingers were digging into my arm as she dragged me into the crowd, walking as fast as she could without running. Being that kid, I squealed and loudly kept saying, What are you doing? Ouch! Mom, you're hurting me. That hurts. Where are we going? While trying to stop. She gritted her teeth and silently dragged me for about three streets before stopping somewhere less busy for a second. It was only then that she let go of my arm, rubbing it and looking extremely upset. Looking me dead in the eye, she explained that as I was talking outside the shop, she had noticed an old man stood behind me. 
He was dirty and disheveled, like the horror movie stereotype of a creepy old man. I had long pretty hair as a little girl, and people stopped us all the time to remark on it, especially when I wore it loose. This old man had very gently lifted a handful of my hair in his hand and was smelling it, tickling his nose as he did so. I was clearly so absorbed in telling my story, I hadn't even realized I was being touched. My mother had made eye contact with the man as he opened his eyes while inhaling the smell of my hair. He gave her an absolutely nauseating toothy grin, quickly dropping my hair and waving at her wagging his fingers all cutesy-like. Whoopsie, you caught me, was the vibe, clearly knowing exactly what he did. He then disappeared into the throng of people moving past. My poor mother immediately felt sick and just went into autopilot mode, dragging me away as fast as she could in the opposite direction. I didn't even know how to react when she told me what happened except to be horrified and so glad that we'd gotten away safely. I still walk past that shop, and the memory of my mother's haunted expression makes me feel ill. Creepy old man. Let's not meet, ever. I had a basset hound named M. She was sweet and cuddly, and firmly believed everyone knows her and loves her, and she loved them in return. Our daily walks were scattered with brief visits with several neighborhoods, so they could pet and love on her. One evening, I was waiting for a delivery from a food service company who came by every two weeks. M loves our regular driver, and he brings her treats. The truck pulls up to the front of the house, and M's demeanor changes. I have never seen her act like this. The hair is up on her back, and she's giving off a constant low growl. I see the driver get out of the truck, and it's not my regular driver. Her growling gets louder. I don't know what the issue is, but I know my dog. She doesn't trust him, so neither do I. The driver usually steps into the house. Not today. I stepped out on the front stoop, but left the front door open and the glass storm door closed. Em is on the other side of the storm door, baring her teeth and growling. The driver approaches, and I hear a whisper, don't show him your back. I stay facing him while he tells me my driver is on vacation. He asks me if I want to see the catalog, and there's some new items he would like to show me. My dog is going crazy and my creeper vibe is going off. I firmly tell him that I only want my pre-order, and I will look at the new items online. He hesitated for several minutes, like he didn't know what to do next, before finally going back to the truck and bringing my order. He says it's heavy, and asks if I want him to carry it inside. I said no thank you, just set it down and my son will take care of it. He sets it down and hesitates again, and it's awkward, and the silence is deafening. So I say, I believe it was prepaid. He finally replied, Yes, of course. He stood there for a moment more, but I was not turning to go inside until he leaves. He finally turns and goes to the truck and leaves. Instantly, my happy dog is back, and I open the door to find my 12-year-old son is hiding against the wall next to the door with the largest knife from my kitchen. I give him a questioning look, and he says, M says he's dangerous, and I was going to be ready if he tried anything. He trusts his dog, too. My friends and I were driving back from a rave in Denver. We take 287 from Fort Collins to Laramie because it's the quickest way home. 287 is a beautiful drive during the day, but empty and sketchy at night, especially during winter. I was in the back seat, so I missed this, 
but I asked my friend, who was in the passenger seat, to tell me the story again. Owl Canyon is a little two-lane detour that I think might have even been unpaved at the time. My friend said there was a car on the side of the road just after Owl Canyon, so rocky ass cliffs. It was pitch black either side of the road. There was a guy just chilling in the middle of the road in all black, trying to wave us down. We didn't see him till maybe like 20 to 30 feet, and we had to swerve to miss him. I don't know why he wanted us to stop, but I don't think it was for anything good. This would have been around 3 a.m. probably, and like I said, it would be empty out there at that hour. So this is weird. The helper in me is like, maybe he was in trouble, but I'm glad my friends have some street smarts, because if he had some bad intentions or some kind of weapon, we would have been fucked. We were all pretty young at the time, too. This isn't as exciting as some other stories, but I wanted to give some Wyoming flavor to the sub. This state is so big and empty. There's no way there's not some backwards creepy stuff happening all the time. So this happened a few days ago. I work at a bar and usually travel home between 12.30 and 1.30 a.m. In the warm months, I'll use my bike or electric scooter. On this night, I was riding the scooter. I was only a few minutes away from home at this point, but I'd heard my phone go off a couple of times in my purse, so I decided to stop a moment to make sure it wasn't anything important. I realized this probably wasn't the greatest decision, but I don't normally get notifications like that so late at night. So I go to pull over on the sidewalk near a sloped entrance into the plaza that has a couple of bushes on either side, and on the left side, a stone fence of sorts with more plants. I would have been maybe 15 or 20 feet away from the left at that point. As soon as I stopped and went to get my phone out, I noticed movement out of the corner of my eye. It was a tall, thin man standing up from where he'd been hiding in the bushes on the left side of the entrance. He was looking right at me. He said something I couldn't make out and started to walk toward me. I immediately got the scooter and drive and back onto the road after that. I don't ever stop and talk to people at this time of night as a matter of principle, but anyone hiding in the bushes at 1am certainly isn't someone I want to deal with. Sadly, things like this happen a lot though this instance was definitely one of the creepiest I've experienced. And yeah, I definitely realized I shouldn't have stopped, let alone when I was so close to home. Don't make my mistake, everyone, and always be vigilant when you're out at night, especially alone. I was 22 or 23 at the time, driving from California to Oregon alone in my tiny Toyota. I split the driving up into a handful of days. Each place I stayed wasn't exactly nice. Some of the places I stopped were downright red flag scary, like get away right now sort of spots that I left pretty quickly. This was not one of those places. I stopped in one of the last California towns to get some rest and some in and out before leaving the state. It's a nice enough Motel 6 or something like that. I arrive in the late afternoon, put my stuff away and head right back out to get my in and out and eat it at the hotel and watch the sunset before hitting the hay. I was pretty tired from driving, nothing too alarming during check-in or loading out but I do notice a fellow checking in while I leave to get my burger and fries. Finally, I sit by the pool and whip out my meal, and I'm having a grand old time. There's nowhere to sit outside, so I'm by the pool fence, snacking. I'm facing the hotel rooms, and see that guy from earlier around the corner upstairs, glaring at me. He continues to glare at me. A young woman, alone, eating outside a hotel in a not terribly great city. He rounds the corner, moves to the stairs, goes down them, and does not take his eyes off me. 
He then walks across the parking lot. This perfectly normal, albeit angry looking guy makes it clear he's coming up to talk to me. When he loudly asks from about halfway across the lot to me, Do you work here? I did not skip a beat and moodily said from behind my burger, Yes, what can I do for you? And then he spits and storms off, walks away. I don't see him go to the front desk person for help or anything like this. I don't wonder too hard about how he hoped that conversation went. I thought it was a little chilling. I'm so mentally and emotionally drained from this whole situation. Some more important things to know before I get into it. I'm a 24-year-old trans guy who's a homosexual and aromantic, and even though I don't flaunt my sexuality, I don't exactly hide it either. I've made a couple of posts on Facebook stating this, so I don't know how she didn't know. She herself is a 23-year-old woman and I've known her for almost two years. Anyway, this takes place the day after Valentine's Day, and I'm getting off work at about 3.30ish, when Tiffany asks me if I wanted to get dinner with her at a specific steakhouse that I really like. So I join her at the restaurant, thinking we were just hanging out because I had no reason to believe that a lady I was friends with for two years would want to date an obviously gay man. I ordered chicken strips and water, and she ordered a lot of food, like a lot. During the whole meal, she tried to share her food with me, and I kept refusing because I just wanted chicken strips. We discussed a few topics and some weird ones. The weird ones were asking about past relationships and experiences with others. I vaguely mentioned that I haven't dated in a few years and usually just end up getting my needs met with a stranger. I kept it vague as we were in a restaurant, and even though I'm open about my experiences with friends, I don't think that sharing explicit details in a public setting is appropriate. I honestly kind of felt uncomfortable as she tried to pry me for details, but I just told her that I didn't feel like this was a good place to talk about stuff like that. She eventually dropped it, once we finish, I went to pull out my card to pay for my meal, and she stopped me, saying that she'd pay for it, and I asked if she was sure. She insisted, so I let her pay because my meal was really cheap. The bill total ended up being almost $100. Like I said, she got a lot of food. I thanked her for the meal and I Ubered home. About 2am on the 16th, two hours before I had to get up for work, I was woken up by a lot of Facebook messages from Tiffany, calling me all sorts of names and other crazy messages from her. I responded half dead with, what? And as soon as I sent a few messages asking what she was talking about, she called me on Facebook Messenger and I answered, still half asleep. She immediately started screaming at me saying, I paid for your meal. I can't believe you. You let me on. I spent a lot of money on that meal. The least you could do was hook up with me. And some other crazy scream that I was unable to understand. Because screaming at a half-asleep person through a phone doesn't come out as clear as you think. I ended up hanging up because I needed sleep. And maybe she was drunk or had messaged me by mistake. So I fell back asleep. Guys, I honestly thought that I'd never seen a grown woman go so batshit crazy. When I woke up at 4.30 in the morning, I was gifted with a wonderful wall of notifications of 87 Facebook messages and 17 missed Facebook calls. Thank goodness this girl didn't have my actual number. While I was getting ready and waiting to clock in at 6.30 a.m., I read them all, and the amount of horrible and disgusting things this girl had sent was just baffling. She called me everything from homophobic slurs, sexist comments, calling me a dirty half-breed who should have died in the womb along with your mom. I'm of Mexican and Spanish descent, 
so I think she was referring to that. She said some other extremely disgusting shit. She also demanded I pay her a hundred dollars for the trouble. After reading all that, I clocked in for my eight hour shift, immediately regretting reading all of that before. And after getting off, I get home to more horrible messages. I sit down in a discord call with friends, and I end up dumping the whole thing on them because I was stressed out and extremely cranky. And during that call, I'm thinking about how to go about this when a wonderful idea pops into my head. I should send some screenshots of these to her parents. So I pick through all the messages, making sure to get the best ones to send and send them to her mom and dad. A little bit about her parents. Her parents are the sweetest and kindest people I've met. The mom is a sweet southern Christian woman who's the type to bake cookies for the new neighbors and is very loving in the love thy neighbor no matter what. She knew I was gay and trans, but her daughter didn't until later. And her dad is the upfront and clear and take no shit kind of person. The way he talks is kind of annoying, but I like it because he tells you exactly what he thinks. Anyways... Her mom messages me a bit later saying, I'm so sorry about this. I had no idea. I can't believe she would say or do something like this. This isn't how we raised her. I hope you don't think we think the same about you. After about 10 or so minutes after, Tiffany messages me back saying, Did you just message my mom? And I didn't answer. Some time passes and her dad messages me apologizing for his daughter's words and acts, and then goes on to say that they've kicked her out of their house, taken away permission to drive their car, refused to pay any more of her college expenses, and her brothers have cut contact with her, one of which is married to a Mexican woman. So you can imagine how he took the half-breed comment she made. After that, it was silence. No messages, no calls, no nothing. Until today, I get on and went to go look at Facebook and notice her Facebook is gone. She's completely deleted it, so it's over. I'm not afraid of her finding me because she doesn't know where I live or work. She doesn't know any of my contact information other than Facebook. This whole situation has been unnecessarily stressful and just terrible. I did ask her parents if they were okay with me talking about it publicly and luckily they were okay with it. Hey guys, I hope you enjoyed that. If you have a scary story of your own to share and you would like me to feature it on the channel, please send it to the email in the description. Or if you prefer, head over to my subreddit, r slash stories from Mr. Revenant. It's the stories that keep the channel going. Thank you all for listening. And thank you to my channel members and patrons. Laney. Tripping Balls Through History. Samantha. Erica. Alyssa. Tracy. Killian's Place. April. James Arterburn. Jen. Joy. Handout. Pegasus Genesis. Karen Keating. V. Berry, LJ, Fiona X. Fox, Scott, I Like Booty, Monica Level Ace, Chris and Donna, Holly Spry, Kimber, Jasmine, Sanatix, Heather Haven, Kitty Cat Luna 2, ADHD Aurora, Janice, Cinderella Baby, Borderline Betty, Lady Dracard, Erica Nicole, Snowball Rathena, Melanie, The Honeybee 987, Pretty Girl 215, Ryan, Brooke, Wendy, Crafty Kel, Tina, Dina, Vampy Debs, Patricia, Amber, Krista, Brenda, Absinthe Alice, Christy, Kay, Spider's Web, Ooh La La Andrea, Sue, Monique, Sean Gorman, Emma Lisa, 
Sigma Cube X, Greg, Chelsea, Amanda Jane, Sam, Zeb Tepe, Sarah C, Austin, Tegan, Lil Smart, Jenny, Gabrielle, Fire 05, Sarah P, James Gargano, Gemma Allen, Monica Level Ace, and Alex. I hope you're all doing well, guys. I'll see you all on the next one.